The material that you're about to listen to and engage with came from our 2017 Missiology Lectures when myself, along with my colleague Johnny Ramirez Johnson, said we need to do this next 2017 Missiology Lectures on this topic of race theology mission. And we invited Dr. Love Seacrest to engage with us in that process. We wanted to explore the challenging questions regarding racism and ethnocentrism and xenophobia and all of those issues from the perspective of world Christianity with regard to how these realities have existed in many parts of the world and also as part of the colonial mission endeavors. It is fascinating to think that the realities we were talking about are not the experiences of one individual or even one society. We're talking about whiteness as a way of defining the world. And the conference and the conference presenters address time and again this epistemology, this way of making meaning. It has also been described as colonization and post-colonization. The question is not, it's not about guilt, it's about engagement. It's about what are we going to do with what we have inherited. Uh, so the fact that we're having the conversation should not point a finger at you as a listener or viewer. But these are hard conversations. Um, the conversation about race is one that has been deferred for so long and so often, over and over again, as soon as we get close to having a meaningful conversation about race, um, we recoil from the pain of it. And so in our lectures, there are, you'll see some of that pain emerge. You'll see some people who have long experienced racism uh, express and, de and declare and name experiences that they um, have had that have been deeply formative, deformative even. So this conversation is not a pretty one, but we're having it. As observers, as uh, listeners, you will be engaging and we invite you to invite the Holy Spirit. The three of us pray a lot about this series. Mm -hmm. We humbly submit it to God and plead it for God's mercy to lead us. We are feeble and combined, we are imperfect, and we have prayed that the Lord will fill the gaps. And the conversation is only a starter. It is in your hands. It is in your community. It is in your family. And most importantly, it is on your knees. Mm. Over the last several days, I've had a chance to meditate on this talk. And as, as I've done so, uh, the first response that I have to make is simply that I really just want to be silent. Because I actually think that what has been distilled in this lecture is so uh, extraordinary and exquisitely important, urgent and compelling, demanding and encompassing that I just want to be quiet in front of it. It names things that are named by others in important and truthful ways, but it names things in ways that it seems to me puts its finger on things that not only I, but I think we, many we's in this room, really need to hear and really need to grapple with and understand. And so I first want to respond really by simply calling myself into silence and you as well. I'd encourage you to sit with this for a long time. But it also doesn't make me want to just remain uh, silent. It actually makes me want to say nothing because it compels me to feel that the only thing that's worth doing is something that's more active. Words seem silly and ridiculous in the face of what we've just heard. It's about action. It's not because words don't matter or the reflection doesn't matter or that other kinds of responses might be possible. But in the end, the kind of thing that's being named by what Dr. Jennings has so helpfully outlined and even more expansively described in the full paper is really something to which action 
is really the primary response, action that claims and lives into geography and space and bodies and locations and neighborhoods and communities. This is really acutely true because I happen uh, to be president of a theological institution and I'm a tall white male. My own gut tells me to act and otherwise just shut up. It's not enough to talk, nor even to try to understand. It's about dismantling something. It's about dismantling whiteness. It's about dismantling white supremacy and being part of a diverse community that actually remakes this and I hope many other institutions as well. This is really uh, no discrete task, however. It involves the dismantling of many things. It's not simply one thing. In this case, let's say Fuller Theological Seminary. It involves the dismantling of forms of the academy that are considered sacred. It involves facing collisions between various academic guilds and competitors of different kinds. They may be intellectual, they may be moral or philosophical. They, there may be institutional churches or ministries or ethnicities or cultures, and it's always and ever live theater. It's the only way that it can be done. There's no place for stasis. There's no place for rest or escape. There's no conflict-free zone. You can't do this without pain, without suffering, and without loss. There's no place uh, for an easy kind of common, common agreement. All naive expectations about some kind of easily achieved shalom have to be in some way reordered, shattered, left in disarray until sufficient quiet and agreement and readiness together has been created in order to necessarily come to a new future. It does not mean eliminating tension. It actually involves redistributing it. And it is what must be done against the backdrop, not least of 500 plus years of doing everything to control and justify and dominate through whiteness. It is what must be done. And I want to do in this season, for example, for me in my own current role, as much as possible toward making a way for the whiteness of Fuller Seminary to be dismantled. This is not some kind of institutional goal. Uh, this is not something which is done as a result of some kind of resolution someplace. This is the work of actually just engaging reality actually as it is, as opposed to as it appears. This is what the resistance that Dr. Jennings is talking about requires. It means letting the resistance expose the evidence of the whiteness that a place like Fuller would protest as part of its past, but in doing so often simply deny the reality that has truly deeply, profoundly shaped us. This is to work consistently towards a kind of decoupling uh, of what Dr. Jennings has argued is the destructive cataclysmic fusion between the gospel and what it means to be white. So this is part of how I respond. Another part of how I respond is that it simply makes me overwhelmingly and deeply sad. This is not what I think is sometimes thought of as white guilt. There's plenty of that to go around, and I have certainly experienced my share of that. That's not exactly what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a deep sadness, a sadness that is like a groaning of creation that groans under what we've been hearing about tonight. It's why, in a way, it's a benchmark of the kind of death toward which whiteness can so often lead, because it is a groaning, a denial of the trajectory and vitality of creation itself. And frankly, it can seem at times so engulfing, so traumatizing, so disabling, so bleak, that it's hard to imagine another kind of reality. This is exactly, of course, why the Christian gospel is needed. But when the Christian gospel is taken hostage by a completely different kind of fusion, with an energy and a vision and a pattern which actually subverts the very gospel, that makes it so much less that it is literally rendered impotent which is at least one way of measuring the current state of the church in America. 
That is an extraordinary tragedy. It brings me to my own version of the problem of evil. Classically stated as if God is all good and all powerful, why does evil exist? My version of that problem is this. If God is all good and all powerful, why is the church so unchanged? Let alone, why does the church, not least the white church, perpetuate and contribute to, if not sufficiently repent of its initiating role in the dominating abuse of power, failing to seek what it would mean to live into the new community that is meant to be the kingdom of God. Faithful worship has always been about reordering power. That's why worship is our only life-giving source. It is the thing that actually rescues us. It redeems us to be reminded in corporate and private, spontaneous, public, and personal ways that we bow before the one who alone is the source of life and let all other power, all other kinds and claims to life be reordered by the reality of that God. All forms of power need to be reordered. Every kind of power needs to be reordered. My power needs to be reordered. My institutional power needs to be reordered. It is part of the claim of what the Christian gospel in the world is actually meant to do. It's the thing that actually the scripture is called being set free. The exquisite title of the question of this address, can white people be saved, is really the perfect way to capture the horrific irony of the colonialist project. In its most vigorous inception, the question was probably the opposite. Can any besides white people be saved? But now, as that project has played itself out toward death, it actually has been flipped. And the question becomes, no, can white people be saved? Not white people, but white or other kinds of people who live inside whiteness. Now the bankruptcy of that project does what human violence always does, which is inevitably reveal that violence is self-abusive from the start and it will always eventually show itself. So buried in the madness and arrogance of this colonialist vision was the failure to see its own demise. It was precisely the tension of Nebuchadnezzar, on the one hand, having a horrific vision so horrific that he needed special authority to have spiritual insight into its meaning in Daniel chapter two, and then blithely in chapter three, builds his own nightmare and asks for all those in the kingdom to bow down before it. Is this so far from the way that the colonialist vision, now thought of as the whiteness vision, has continued to exist? I'm deeply moved by what we've heard tonight, and I am in agreement with what has been said, if not, in fact, really intense agreement. What I want to do is to underscore the opening assumption regarding the inextricable connection between colonial, which tonight I want to call whiteness, colonial power or whiteness, and the Christian gospel. This fusion, this is not inferential, but explicit, and it takes shape from the time when the doctrine of discovery was initiated in the 15th century all the way to today in the way the most ordinary interpersonal and systemic dynamics of power play out against the reality of the way in which our lives are held captive by this kind of racialized power that conjoins the gospel to the thing that itself is the source of destruction. If there's anything that I tried to convey at the time that I was being considered to become the president of Fuller, it was that I saw the American church, not least the American church, but the American church in a season of unbelievable crisis, that its identity and its very claims to any sort of truth let alone any sort of genuine good news, was actually at stake. That in fact, if there was going to be a church in the 21st century, it would have to be a church that would be remade. It would have to emerge, especially when we're thinking of the white church. It would have to be a church literally revived 
it would require a kind of theological and personal revival in order to bring the reality of the gospel to have any kind of authentic witness in a culture where the issues of race and racialization have so distorted the gospel that the capacity for the, tr the truth and mercy and justice of Jesus Christ to show itself seems at times almost impossible to imagine. This is why we end, ourselves, we end up finding ourselves in a moment like this where in fact the American church not least the American evangelical church, is so radically divided, where in fact the social paradigms are so utterly distinct that the capacity to be able to find unity, something that we would call unity in Christ, is, it seems, almost impossible to imagine. Is it because we're actually thinking of a different Christ? Is it because we have a different image of the very one that we both claim is Savior? And it's not just both as though it is one and not the other, it's a, an array, but in that spectrum, where do we allow for the deep revival of heart and mind and spirit, and especially in Dr. Jennings' closing comments about renewed communities across different kinds of lines and connectedness is the core of our transformation. My own work in this area, which is an existential work, has gone on since I was a little boy in the context of two homesteading families, one in Oregon and one in Washington where the land mattered in every way to our family, where the sense of physicality of the earth, the dirt, was absolutely a part of my childhood. And though I was raised in a white family, my parents had exceptional instincts to think that it really mattered that I grew up in a context like that, but actually had friends that were part of Yakima Nation and new families that were immigrant families that came to our valley to work in the fruit industry. But that trajectory went on to a surprising degree when I became a Christian. That didn't happen for me until I was in college. In the context of that process, my dad, who was a wonderful father and saved certain neck veins for the discussion of religion, <laughs> really wanted to make sure that his two sons, if at all possible, did everything they could to have nothing to do with religion and religious devotion. You can see this didn't turn out too well for him. <laughs> But his critique is very much at the core of what we're talking about tonight. His anxiety was that what religion does is that it takes great things and it makes them very small. And it was his hope that his sons would have a sense of the, the, the imagination of the world, the beauty and splendor and reach of the world, the diversity of the world, the capacity of the world to be discovered, not in the sense of claiming and owning, but actually just having your heart and mind widened by the reality of that. I started reading the Gospels, and I was stunned as I entered college to discover that Jesus and my dad had so much in common. <laughs> This would not have been my impression. I thought that pastors were neurotic and certainly their children were. <laughs> but what did shock me even more was the discovery that Jesus' antidote was so dramatically different than, than the one that my father had, which was not about the avoidance of religion. It was about the discovery of the kingdom of God, which cracks open reality, but not an imaginative reality or a reality above the earth so much as a reality in the earth in the context of a life and a kingdom that is meant to enact and display and make clear a reality that is so much bigger than the small, pathetic whiteness that our lives could so easily be caught in. It would be a pathetic tragedy if Fuller Seminary and other Christian institutions like it were to simply stay trapped in that small box instead of actually understanding that the character of what we're about is something so much deeper and so much richer and so much more important than that small little enterprise. Yeah.